This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. How would you like about six o'clock every night, Jesus come to your house and say, you have any questions? How many times have you prayed? Oh, it'd be so good if Jesus would just come and sit here beside me and help you understand this verse of scripture. Help me to understand what I'm going through. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Welcome to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. Good to have you here today. I wanna to welcome all of you that might be new. You haven't tuned in before, well do so. We're glad that you're here. And if you enjoy this broadcast, I'm sure you enjoy them from day after day. We do have archives on YouTube, so all my stuff is there. So if you wanna go back and look at some other stuff, you can. But again, we're just glad to have you here today, including those who watch continually who send me those good reports, how much you love it. And on top of that, those that are my partners, you guys are so close to me. Thank you so much. And for those of you who'd like to be a partner and join the greatest group of people in the world, as far as I'm as concerned, next to Jesus' disciples are my followers, those who are partners with me and you'd like to become a partner with them. Well, just join me and then go to the website, bobyandian.com. You'll find a place there on our uh, face page where you can join and become a partner with us. Looking forward to having you. Hebrews chapter one, we're gonna take a look at the first two verses. I wanna talk about the benefits of the New Testament. Today, we're just gonna cover the fact that, you know, if, if Hebrews said we have a better covenant, established on better promises. Well, you know, that just simply means the New Testament is superior to the old. Doesn't mean it did away with it. It simply means, you know, now that we've moved, God progressively moves from time to time. In fact, the Old Testament and the New Testament are laid out in time periods, and that's brought out here in verses one and two. I like to think of this way. The first one, which again was in a sense the greatest one, I mean, the Adam and Eve lived in a perfect environment, a perfect world until they sinned. Every time period is God building back up. Every one is like a brighter day leading to the great day for a thousand years. We're going to have a thousand year garden of Eden here on earth called the millennium. Let's take a look at the first two verses of Hebrews chapter one, verses one and two. God who at different times and in different ways. Now I'm quoting the King James there, but let's come back to what mine says here. And that is God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers, that's the Jewish fathers, through their prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom, that's through Jesus Christ, he also made the worlds or the ages. Three different things are said here. First of all, that God spoke at different time periods in the Old Testament, and he spoke in different ways. And also it's speaking here in the closing of verse two, that Jesus Christ made the worlds, the Greek word I own simply means ages. All these things are called dispensations, time periods or ages. And of course, in each one, like I said, each one progressively gets better. I wanna go back here to those first opening two verses and look at it again. God who at various times or different time periods and in different ways, spoke in time past, that's the Old Testament, to the Jewish fathers, the patriarchs, but he spoke to them through the prophets. First of all, this is simply telling us in every time period, the Greek word palumeros, God at different time periods, and in different ways, palutropos. It simply means God at different time periods spoke in different ways. In every time period, how God approached man has always been different. How God spoke to them has always been different. And so he spoke in the, in the Old Testament through five time periods, we're gonna mention them, and in every time period, God spoke to man in a different way. And so first of all was innocence. And so God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden and came to see them every day at the same time, the cool of the evening. How would you like about six o'clock every night, Jesus come to your house and say, you have any questions? How many times have you prayed? Oh, it'd be so good if Jesus would just come and sit here beside me and help you understand this verse of scripture. Help me to understand what I'm going through. If he would just appear to me. Well, that happened in one time period. Every day at the same time, Jesus Christ would come and talk with Adam and Eve. What a wonderful thing. So again, this is how, and not only that, but they walked with him. The Adam and Eve walked with the Lord through the garden. And again, he talked to them, they communed with him. The second dispensation or time period after innocence was conscience where every dad did, man did right in what, his own, what he saw in his own eyes. 
And then also that after that was human government. And so from conscience to human government, how God spoke to them at that time was direct voices from heaven, visitation by angels. Even Jesus Christ himself came, called the angel of the Lord. And this is how he spoke to, uh, at the time period of the conscience, that that ended at the time of the flood. And so he spoke to Noah during that time. Human government came after that. That ended at the Tower of Babel when men decided to come together and make one giant government that would go to heaven and, and basically just take the place of God. But God spoke from heaven heaven directly. And again, angels came and visited. Jesus Christ came himself and did that also. After that was the dispensation of promise that after the Tower of Babel, God came and communicated with one man that he found named Abram and through him started the Jewish race and also from him started a, a, a long uh, reign of people after that that were called people of faith. And that was the stars of heaven and that's the spiritual race and the sands of the sea was the natural race called Israel. And so again, that was that time period. And during that time period, again, the Lord spoke to Abraham directly, spoke to him, directed him, led him, guide him. And then the next one that came along was from Moses all the way till the time of Jesus Christ hanging on the cross. This was the dispensation of the law. During that time, there were direct voices from heaven. There was a written law. There were sacrifices. There was smoke that represented the presence of God. And even the presence of God was in the smoke. There was a rock and the rock that followed them, we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, was Jesus Christ. Then there was the cloud that covered them by day. And so these are all the dispensations of the Old Testament. But I want you to notice something. It says in that verse of scripture again, that God who in different time periods, and I've just mentioned five of them in the Old Testament, God who at different time periods, different ways spoke to man in time past. In every time period, how that God approached man has always been different. No two were exactly the same. Now, some of these things, again, overrode each other. There were some that appeared in all of them, but in basically in every dispensation, how God approached man has been different. But it goes on to say there in the next verse, he's spoken that's by his son, the way that man has approached God has always been the same. I'm gonna say that again. How God approached man has always been different, but how man approaches God has always been the same. And the way that man has always approached God is by faith. And that's for every dispensationary time period. Hebrews chapter 11. We're in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews here in this chapter talks about how the Old Testament is different than the New Testament and how God approached man differently in each time period. But we're also going to find out that there's a chapter in chapter 11 where everyone in different time periods approach God the same way by faith. By faith, Abel. By faith, Noah. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Moses. By faith, Abram. By faith, Sarah. We go down the list and all the way to the time periods when they crossed over the promised land, the time periods of the kings after that, and the common denominator through all of those was man approaches God the same way, and that is by faith. Well, that helps us to understand some things. The dispensation of the law, man wasn't saved by the keeping of the law. The way that man approached God was always the same. And so no one was saved during the dispensation of the law by keeping the law. In fact, it was impossible. On top of that, if God gave the law to Israel for salvation, then God was really just, I mean, he found one group of people and he highly favored them. If salvation is for every person of every nation and always has been, then why would he give one, the law to one group of people say, here's the way to find me, only you can have it? No, and on top of that, Israel was the smallest nation just about on the face of the earth. No, the purpose of the law was for them to understand Christ. The law was given to us as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The purpose of the law was to teach about Jesus Christ and the law and the sacrifices did that. Then they took the message of Jesus Christ to the world. You think that when Jonah went to Nineveh, he preached the law? No, he was. it's time for those people to get saved. He didn't walk down the street saying, keep the law, be, be circumcised and don't eat pork or shrimp. No, he didn't say those things. He didn't walk down the street telling people to tithe and all those things. No, he walked down the street with one word, repent. And the people from the king down to the peasants repented, turned their lives over to God, over to the Lord Jesus Christ. They called him Jehovah, but that's how they got saved. The same way that everyone has ever got saved through the word of God. How God approaches man is different in every time period, but how man approaches God has always been the same. 
So it comes down to this. The way that man has approached God has always been the same, faith for salvation and faith for pleasing God. In our daily walk and growth, faith gets us saved and faith makes us spiritual as we apply the word of God to our daily life. So it comes down to this. The New Testament, though, is different on how God approaches man. And how God approaches man in the New Testament is through many different great things we're gonna talk about in the remainder of this broadcast. It comes down to this. The Old Testament, and the New Testament, we often get them confused. And some say, well, you know, Jesus came and fulfilled the law, and therefore the Old Testament's been done away because it's called the law. I agree that a name for the Old Testament was the law, but on top of that, the law was really a segment of the Old Testament, and salvation was always the same before, during the law, and after the law, they were saved by faith. I think of chapter four of the book of Romans. Two heroes are brought out in that chapter about how they were saved by faith. Number one was Abraham. Abraham had faith in the Lord. It was accounted to him for righteousness. And then later on it says, and David also, who said, happy is the man whom the Lord imputes not his trespasses against him. And both of them were saved by faith. You say, well, what does that got to do with anything? Abraham was before the law, saved by faith. David was during the law, saved by faith. You'd have thought that David would have talked about the purpose of sacrifices was to save him, but that's not the purpose of sacrifices. It's impossible, Hebrews tells us, that the blood of bulls and goats should remove sin. They taught of the one who could remove sin. So that's again how God spoke in the Old Testament. How he spoke in the New Testament is different. It comes back to this, you have the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Old Testament in the New Testament is called shadows, shadows pointing to the reality. You know, if you see a shadow of a tree, if you follow that shadow far enough, you'll get to the tree. What the Old Testament was, was types and shadows. And so by following that shadow, you'll come all the way to where the light is shining in the New Testament on an object such as the cross, such as the resurrection, shines on that, and it goes all the way back to the Old Testament, and you'll see types and shadows of that. You'll see teachings that that tell you what's going to come without getting real specific. Once in a while, something specific comes out of the Old Testament, such as the cross, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53 gets into descriptions of it, but overall, it remains shadows, types and shadows. And so you follow it long enough. All I'm saying is why study the shadows when you have the reality? But the best way to study the shadows is understand the reality first, then go back and study the shadows. The New Testament fulfilled the old. It did not destroy it. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill it. So the New Testament fulfills the Old Testament. It did not destroy it. Well, it comes back to this. Summer fulfills spring, but it doesn't destroy spring. Manhood fulfills childhood, but it doesn't destroy childhood. All these things that are literally precursors are those that lay the foundation for what's eventually going to come. You don't go back and destroy the foundation. And the the foundation for the New Testament is the Old Testament. And we were built on the foundation of the apostles. That's the writings of the New Testament. And the prophets, that's the writing of the Old Testament. The two work together. Thank God we live in the church age. Thank God we live in this better time period of which it said in the word of God, we have better covenant established on better promises. I'll see you right after the break. For centuries, in nearly every culture that has ever existed in the earth, the concept of the blood covenant has been universally understood and accepted as a contract which is complete and ever binding. With this in-depth series titled, A Better Covenant, Pastor Bob Yandian examines, contrasts, and compares the blood covenant of the Old Testament with the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross and reveals the new and better covenant now available to every born-again believer. Topics include, The Life is in the Blood, A Friend That Sticks Close, Mephibosheth, A Covenant History, Why the Law, The Blessings of Abraham, Covenant Attitudes, and God's Covenant with David. To order a better covenant in nine CD set or as MP3 downloads, visit bobyandian.com. A new book just came in. I've been waiting on this book, Theology Simplified. This is a class I teach at Karis Bible College. And I've been waiting to put this into a book. It's eight different theological terms that sound difficult but actually are very simple. I just simply think the Bible sometimes is filled with complicated sounding words, but you break it down, it becomes very simple. This book is called Theology Simplified. Let me tell you what all it covers. It covers predestination. It covers reconciliation and sanctification. It covers glorification, justification. 
Redemption, propitiation, and election are all covered in this book. And again, big words with simple meanings. I bring it down to you. Go to my website, bobtheandian.com. You'll find how you can have a copy for yourself. Blessings upon blessings to you. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on partnership. Let's go back to the verses we began with, Hebrews chapter one, verses one and two. And I wanna put more emphasis now on verse two, which is talking about the New Testament. And here it says in verse one, God who at different time periods, we talked about there were five of them, another term for them is dispensations or ages. God who at different time periods or ages and in various ways, different ways, spoke in time past the Old Testament to the Jewish fathers through their prophets has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Isn't it interesting the church age is called the last days? Folks, we are living in the last days, but we're living the last of the last days because the last days began on the day of Pentecost. And even uh, Peter on that day stood up and reported what the prophet Joel had said. And prophet Joel said, it'll come to pass in the last days. Well, the last days, you might say, well, that's, that's, a, that's a time of coming of Jesus. Oh yeah, but that's the end of the church age. That's the end of this dispensation time period. But it began with a, with the phrase, the last days. And Peter quoted that, it'll come to pass in the last days. And your sons and daughters will prophesy, I'll pour of my spirit upon all flesh. That occurred on that day, but still here today. So we might as well say the last days have been around for some 2000 years. This is the longest dispensation of any of the five we mentioned before. This is the sixth one. And it's much longer than those. Why? Because we're living in the dispensation of grace. And God has taken more time to show his grace and his favor. During this time, we have not been appointed under wrath. God holds back on his wrath. He holds back on, he's gonna show it one day coming up. But you know what? Right now during the church age, we don't see the wrath of God. We might see the anger of God toward us when we sin. God does get angry when we sin, but he doesn't get wrathful, he doesn't point his wrath on us, but his anger toward sin, his dislike toward sin is changed by our attitude change and by the word of God. God's displeased with us when we sin and comes to us to help correct us and bring us back into line. But that is far from the wrath of God that's gonna be poured out one day. Notice this has in these last days, that's the church age, spoken unto us through his son, the Old Testament through prophets, to Israel, the New Testament through Jesus, to his church, whom he's appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the time periods or the ages. So with all this we're studying here, I wanna talk about now the benefits of being in the New Testament. This verse even says right here that what we have today is he's spoken unto us through his son and he's appointed him heir of all things. And what happened to us, we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ through whom also Jesus Christ made all these ages we've been talking about. And again, as it says in Hebrews, we have a better covenant established upon better promises. And so we live in this time period called the church age. You know, the benefits we have, we often don't stop to think about how blessed we really, really are and how much we have in the New Testament. I mean, the fact that we have, we have a completed Bible. They didn't have a Bible back there. I mean, the, how did they learn the word? Well, like I said, the uh, types and shadows and the uh, sacrifices and laws that were given from God helped to paint a picture of redemption, but they didn't have a Bible in front of them. They had to go talk to a prophet. They had to go talk to a priest to understand God's will for their life. And the Holy Spirit might speak to the prophet, to the priest and give it to you. Uh, listen, I think there's times a prophet may give you something, but stop this thing of running from service to service, church place to church place, or meeting to meeting, and looking for a prophet to prophesy over you what you're supposed to do. The Holy Spirit will tell you personally something that didn't happen in the Old Testament. I mean the perfect communication of the Holy Spirit to us. And this is what's being taught today. I'm so grateful for the teaching on grace today that has just overwhelmed everything because it's like when the message of faith came out, it was because there was a drought in the nation and among Christians everywhere around the world of just what faith was. And so this message became popular. Today, there's a big emphasis on the grace of God because if all you understand is the message of faith, you can become very legalistic. It's all up to me. No, it all started with God. God's grace, God's mercy, God's outpouring. 
And faith is my empty hand reaching out to receive from God's full hand. And so we talk about the benefits of the New Testament we have today over the Old Testament. And I'm telling you, you ought to be so grateful you're born in the New Testament. On top of that, I believe we're living just before the return of Jesus Christ for his church. You were born for such a time as this. You've been appointed to this time period, reserved for this time period. So quit complaining about all the stuff happening in the earth as if you're afraid of everything. Stand up and understand God put you here. Here's the main part. He trusts you. He trusts you with his word. He trusts you with the message of grace and trusts you as a child of God, something that never occurred in the Old Testament. No one was a child of God till the first child of God came, Jesus Christ. And now we are now, after that, sons and daughters of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's talk about some of these benefits that we have today. Number one is in the Old Testament, there was no spiritual birth. We call it the new birth today. In the Old Testament, that didn't happen. They remained as a sinner as far as their relationship with God, but they were accounted righteous. They didn't have to go to hell when they died, but they certainly didn't get to go to heaven. No, they went to an underground compartment called paradise, and that's where they waited. And again, uh, when people died, that's where they went. You know, when the thief was on the cross with Jesus, Jesus said, didn't say to him today, you'll be with me in heaven. No, he said, you'll be with me in paradise. And so it was an underground compartment where all Old Testament saints went to. It's almost like it was the waiting area for heaven to open up. Unbelievers go to hell, which is the waiting area for the lake of fire. And so one day both compartments will be empty, but the area called paradise is empty. And when Jesus Christ arose into heaven, all those Old Testament saints went with him and they got to go into heaven. Why? Jesus had to be the first begotten. They became many begotten after that. Jesus had to be the first one born and open up heaven for them so they could go with him. Ephesians tells us in chapter four that when Jesus Christ arose, he took this great company with him and took them up to heaven with him. And so this was Old Testament saints underground in a park compartment. Peace was there. It was also called Abraham's bosom. And uh, so it was just a peaceful place to be in a place of waiting for the time when heaven would be opened to, to them. So again, in the Old Testament, there was no spiritual birth. There was no new birth. Today we have that. When we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, what happens to us is what Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. He didn't understand that. He thought, well, I've already been born once. How do I go back to my mother's womb and be born a second time? And Jesus said, no, no, no. What is born of uh, flesh is flesh. That's your outward man. What's born of the inward man is spirit. He said, spirit produces spirit and flesh produces flesh. Everything produces after its own kind. You are a spirit being on the inside that needs to be born again by the Holy Spirit. So no spiritual birth in the Old Testament, but there is a spiritual birth in the New Testament. Again, in the Old Testament, they were accounted righteous. It says of Abraham, he had faith in the Lord. It was accounted to him for righteousness. It's much like putting it on a sheet of paper. Bob, do you have money in the bank? I don't know. Well, you'll look and see what the accountant says on there. It's on a piece of paper. You don't have the money in your hand, but you see right there how much you have. So God accounted it to Abraham and to all those who put their faith and trust in the Lord, he accounted righteousness to them. What do we have? According to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. I haven't been just accounted righteous. I am righteous. Righteous is not something that I'm going to attain to. I am righteous. Now, there is a walking out in righteousness. There is a godly righteousness before people. That is spiritual growth. That comes through the renewing of your mind to where no longer do you just have the mind of Bob. You now have the mind of Christ. You think his way. But when we're born again, we are literally not accounted righteous. We become the righteousness of God in Christ. My spirit is righteous. My outward life's gonna take a while, but inside I am the righteousness of God. Next of all, we're told this in the next next chapters of Hebrews in chapter three and following, we are not servants in the house of God as they were in the Old Testament. We're now called sons and daughters. Now in those chapters, it said that, that Moses was a servant in the house of God. Here's a high ranking man of the Old Testament. He was a servant in the house of God. You know what that means? He lived in servants quarters. I'm sure that probably this underground compartment would be considered almost servants quarters. 
But in this lifetime, he was called a servant of God. You know what we're called? Sons and daughters. Now, I can tell you this, in the house of God, I can imagine how great a servant's quarters is. It's probably fabulous, incredible. But if that's how good a servant's quarters is, what about sons and daughters? What do we do which actually have bedrooms and all these homes and as the Bible talks about, mansions prepared for us in heaven. So we are not servants in the house of God. We have now been declared to be sons and daughters. Next of all, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was with them. In the New Testament, he is not only with us, he's in us. And as Jesus said, just before he left this earth to go back to heaven, as he stood on the Mount of Olives with his disciples and told them to go into the upper room, he said, the Holy Spirit who is with you and in you, he says, now go because he's gonna come upon you. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you. So in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was only with them. But Jesus said, that in John, he said, the Holy Spirit who is present tense with you shall be future tense in you. That had to shock them. What are you talking about? The Holy Spirit lives in a temple over there. And before they lived in the tabernacle, we could go see it. We could, we could above the tabernacle, above the temple, we can see the glory of God. That's where the Holy Spirit was. And I'm sure Jesus couldn't go on to tell them anymore, especially about the Holy Spirit coming upon you. He had to leave it with, with you and now he's gonna be in you. And they had to mull that over. What do you mean by that? Because when Jesus Christ arose from the dead, the veil was torn from the top to the bottom, not to let us in to see anything, but to let the Holy Spirit out. And 50 days later, he moved into a new temple, us. And on the day of Pentecost, he moved into all those 120 and then everyone that believed in Jesus after that, he moved into them. And I'm sure when he moved into them, he went, ah, no longer a temple made by people's hands, no longer a tent made out of hands. I'm living in a temple made by God. Next of all, believers went to paradise in the New Testament that now go directly to heaven. And here's something interesting. In the Old Testament, if you wanted to find out the will of God, you went to a priest or you went to a prophet to receive guidance and to find out what God's will for your life is. With us, we go directly to the throne of grace. We go right into Jesus' presence and we talk to him. Why? Because we're more, all we are today, which they didn't have in the Old Testament, we are a kingdom of priests and we are a priest walking into our great high priest. We don't have to go through an earthly priest. God wanted to have a kingdom of priests in chapter nine of the book of Exodus, but it didn't work out because of sin in the nation. But once Jesus Christ arose from the dead, he said, now I can have a kingdom of priests that walk on this earth and they can come directly to their great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. Next of all, we have the Holy Spirit's gifts operating. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit operated through certain individuals, prophets, priests, and kings. But the average believer did not have that. Today, every believer has the Holy Spirit living in us, but we also can be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak with tongues. So we can see signs, wonders, and miracles operate in our life, just like Elijah, Elisha, and others of the Old Testament. And finally, in the Old Testament, they were the house of Israel. Today we are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And today we are being fashioned, will be one day totally into the bride of Christ. We're not there yet, but we will be. These are things we have that the Old Testament did not have. People in the Old Testament didn't have. No wonder we have a better covenant established upon better promises. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you tomorrow. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.